Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to our panel discussion today on the impacts of climate change on biodiversity in the oceans. My name is Ivan Semenek. I'm a journalist and I report on science for Canada's national newspaper, uh, The Globe and Mail. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your moderator today and I'd like to start my duties by letting you know that today's event is offered with live interpretation in French. So to access the French feed, you just need to select interpretation French from the options that are at the bottom of your screen. And of course, there's also an interpretation English selection for those who wish to hear the panel discussion in English. Uh, I'd also like to extend a warm welcome from the organizations that are behind today's event, which is the Royal Society of Canada in partnership with the embassies of France and Germany and Canada. For those who aren't aware, the Royal Society of Canada is Canada's National Academy. Uh, its memberships in, include Canada's leading intellectuals, scholars, researchers, and artists. And part of its mission includes mobilizing those scholars in open discussion and debate to advance knowledge, encourage integrated interdisciplinary understanding, and address issues that are critical to Canada and Canadians. And I might say in the case of today's panel, issues that are of global importance. Uh, I'd also like to, on behalf of the Royal Society, uh, 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 provide this land acknowledgement. The Royal Society of Canada and the embassies uh, of France and Germany and Canada are hosting this event, and their offices are located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. From coast to coast to coast, we're grateful to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, First Nations and Métis people and recognize the dozens of languages and cultures indigenous people have brought that enrich what many call Turtle Island. Now, uh, I also just want to mention before we move on to introducing to uh, welcoming uh, welcome from our, uh, our partners and uh, introducing today's panelists that today's event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online in both English and French. The subject of today's panel is to explore the impacts of climate change, which of course we are all talking about right now, but in a specific area that may not be getting as much attention uh, as, as some others, the impact on biodiversity in the oceans. We, uh, we get to see a, a lot of what's happening uh, with respect to climate change on land, in the environment that we interact with every day, uh, in, in the forests and, uh, and across the country in Canada, for example. Uh, but uh, there is another dimension to climate change in the oceans. Uh, so that is the focus today uh, and another important uh, strand in that conversation. Uh, as you may know, this fall, there are two global gatherings of science and political leaders, scientific and political leaders, uh, to discuss these issues. And this is sort of at the interface of both. One is COP15. This is the biodiversity uh, uh, convention of the parties. And then COP26, which deals with climate. Uh, both of those meetings are consequential for the future of life on Earth. I think that's, that's a consensus view. This town hall convenes experts from Canada, France, and Germany with a view to sharing insights about the outcomes of COP15 and the opportunities of COP26. COP15, which deals with biodiversity, partly has already occurred, a second portion of which is going to be happening this spring where countries will be talking about their commitments to, to uh, protecting uh, species and biodiversity on the planet. COP26, of course, is the upcoming climate talks coming uh, in Glasgow next week, starting next week. Uh, so let's kick off today's event with uh, some greetings. Uh, and I'm going to now uh, call for some recorded greetings from the president of the Royal Society of Canada, the ambassador of France to Canada, and also the ambassador of Germany to Canada. So stand by for those recorded messages. My name is Jeremy McNeil. I'm the president of the Royal Society. And it really is a pleasure to be able to say, Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome to this event. As you all know, Canada is a country with an extremely long coastline, and therefore we're delighted to be hosting this event that is addressing the effects of climate change on the biodiversity of oceans. I think it's a particular to note that we're doing it in between two major international events, uh, COP15 and COP26, 
And I think it's important to underline that we are doing this in partnership with our colleagues from France and Germany. This type of event is actually part of the RSC's commitment uh, to amplify the voice of science and scholarship to provide independent expertise for evidence-based policymaking. J'aimerais remercier Son Excellence Madame Karen uh, Rispal et Son Excellence Sabine Spavassa, ainsi que Professor Mona Niemer, the uh, scientific en chef du Canada. I would also like to expend, extend special thanks to Ivan Simonuk, uh, today's moderator, uh, who is a champion for science and scholarship in Canada. I wish you a very good event, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I'm sure I will. Thank you very much. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je suis, uh, très Hello, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome you to this exceptional event organized by the Royal Society of Canada in partnership with the German and French embassies in an international context where the retrograde rhetoric is multiplying and hiding behind skepticism to ignore the calls for action by scientists. I am pleased with the message of commitment sent today by our three countries. The seriousness of the situation has been presented by both the IPBES and the GEC, and it is urgent to find and implement collective solutions to fight against climate change and its effects in particular on biodiversity. We have learned it again with the pandemic. Climate, nature, and humanity are inseparable. And to quote the President of the Republic at the opening of the COP15 of the Convention on Biodiversity, which met 10 days ago, we will not be able to live well and in good health in a sick planet. The COP26, which will kick off in Glasgow on uh, October 31st, will be a crucial step towards the full implementation of the Paris agreements and thus fight against the physical aspects of climate change, such as the rising sea levels, the intensification and increase of in the frequency of extreme weather events or the proliferation of pathogens. In this context, today's reflections on the impacts of climate change on biodiversity in the oceans are absolutely central and they meet the objectives of one ocean summit that France will organize early in 2022 in Brest to support and amplify international support, pollution, ecosystem degradation, overexploitation. Now, despite their immensity and apparent inertia, the oceans suffer like the continents, and it's our responsibility to redouble our efforts to protect them by relying on the valuable work of our researchers. I, therefore, am look forward to a rich and exciting discussion. I hope signs of hope and ideas to moderate the impact of climate on biodiversity in the oceans. I wish you an excellent roundtable, and I thank you for your participation. Welcome to the Town Hall, Impacts of Climate Change on Biodiversity in the Oceans. Bienvenue à cet événement. Merci aux organisateurs de la Royal Canadian Society de nous accueillir. Et merci à nos amis français pour être nos partenaires. Un grand merci aussi à Mona Niemer pour ouvrir avec tant de chaleur et de passion. Biodiversity next to climate change is the other, the most burning global challenge of our time, and both of them condition each other. We witness today dramatic disappearance of species, of genetic diversity, of biotopes and ecosystems, and these are all needed to make our Earth more stable and resilient. In the last hundred years, more bird species have disappeared than in the 3,000 years before. Same picture in what happens in our oceans. All of that 
can have terrible consequences and we need to step up to the plate. Chancellor Merkel has committed Germany to stop the decline of biodiversity. We want to stop it by 2030 and we ask now to protect 30% of our oceans, 30% of the surface of the earth as um, uh, protected areas. We also want to set targets for plastic, for toxic substances in the oceans. We want to raise finances in order to face the challenges of protecting biodiversity. Germany itself has committed to 6 billion euros annually um, uh, and we need others to come along with that. This is an emergency. It's an emergency that science, nations, political leaders need to answer. It is a very topical issue. Thank you for talking about it today. Thank you. And that, of course, was Her Excellency Sabine Sparwasser, Ambassador of Germany to Canada. She was preceded by Her Excellency Karine Rispal, Ambassador of France to Canada, and by Dr. Jeremy McNeil, President of the Royal Society of Canada. I'd like to uh, now welcome Dr. Mona Niemer, who is Chief Science Advisor of Canada. She's joined us here live, and she also would like to an ext extend uh, a welcome to everyone. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, bonjour à toutes et à tous, et merci à la Société Royale du Canada. Yes, well, Good morning to everyone and thank you Ivan, thank you to the Royal Society of Canada. It is such a special day to be here with you. I particularly want to thank the Ambassador of France to Canada, Her Excellency Karen Riesfeld and the Ambassador of Germany to Canada, Her Excellency Sabine Sparswater. And innovation. As we embark on such a critically important discussion about the impacts of climate change on biodiversity in the oceans, we need to remember that never before has the urgency for science-informed decision-making been greater. On ne peut pas lutter contre les changements climatiques sans s'occuper des océans. Et nos océans, ainsi que les écosystèmes marins qui les habitent, sont souffrants. C'est un problème qui dépasse les frontières et qui a un impact sur nous tous. After all, we have to look after our oceans. It is an essential element that we must deal with. Is. And by the way, I would like to pause and thank the Royal Society of Canada for their incredible work during the COVID pandemic, their very informative uh, knowledge synthesis and their numerous reports and uh, insightful recommendations. And as we have seen throughout the pandemic, the way to address urgent global challenges is by building even greater connections of scientific ideas through open science. Working together can and does lead to amazing solutions. So today, in considering the outcomes of COP15 and the opportunities of COP26, I encourage us all to consider more ways that we can collaborate across disciplines and national borders to build a sustainable path forward to take on climate change, pandemics, and other global crises. The urgency is there and action is needed. Working together through science, we can provide the solutions. I look very much forward to the panelists and the discussions ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Niemer. I really appreciate the thought as well. As you say, it has been a very challenging and unprecedented uh, last 20 months, and I think it's one that's very much uh, put science in the spotlight uh, as, a, as a principal tool for navigating challenging policy decisions. And let's hope that that uh, awareness will continue as we move on to uh, as well dealing with uh, challenges like climate change and, and biodiversity. I think if there's one thing the pandemic has taught us, it's that hearing from scientists directly uh, and hearing the uh, evolution of uh, scientific uh, thinking as uh, more evidence is brought to the table is useful for everyone and to see how uh, the data can accumulate and in fact help uh, guide the way and, and also uh, help us understand what needs to be prioritized as we start to plan for the future. So with that in mind, we have a very 
uh, exciting lineup for you. And I think uh, a very interesting discussion coming on the portion of the climate change question that deals with uh, the oceans and of course the overlap with uh, the biodiversity issue as well. Uh, sort of the two key challenges I think that will be uh, facing us, uh, for, you know, potentially for, for much of this century. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our panelists. Uh, we begin with Professor Burkhard Baschek of Germany. He's the director of the German Oceanographic Museum and he holds a professorship in coastal oceanography and instrumentation at the University of Kiel. Uh, we also have Dr. Sarah Iverson with us. She's a professor in the Department of Biology at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Also Dr. Serge Plan, he's the research director at the CNRS, associate professor at the EPHE and associate professor at the Australian Institute for Marine Science. And finally, Julia Baum is a professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Victoria. We'll hear from each of the panelists in turn, and then we'll begin the discussion uh, portion of our event today based on questions that you, the audience, uh, have submitted in advance earlier this week. Uh, should people wish to join the conversation online or learn more about the Royal Society of Canada and its events, uh, policy briefings uh, and so on. You can learn about these in one way is to follow the Royal Society of Canada on Twitter and that's at RSC the Academies. That's the Twitter handle. It's also been included uh, on the PowerPoint slides that uh, accompany today's uh, program. So without further ado, let's turn now to our first panelist, Professor Burkhard Baschek uh, from the German Oceanographic Museum. Dr. Baschek. Thanks, Ivan. Um, this was started two months ago as um, director at, at the uh, German Oceanographic Museum in the far northeastern corner of Germany. I'm a physical oceanographer and I'm, of course, dealing lots with uh, biological issues and at the same time trying to educate people. Uh, here in Stralsund, um, we're um, welcoming about 800 to 900,000 visitors uh, per year. That's about 1% of the German population going through. I think it's important to really like bridge the span between different disciplines, but also reach out uh, to the public to engage them. I will give the discussion today on um, the impact of climate change and biodiversity a physical perspective. And then we all have something like this in mind uh, by now, where we have like a tremendous impact on coral reefs, for example, in our minds, the coral bleaching that's caused by climate change. I will try to put that a little bit in perspective on, on what to expect and what uh, may be coming um, to us here. Um, I also like when we're looking at these pictures, do think that coral reefs are a prime example to showcase what's happening. Uh, but in many other cases, um, the in partly devastating state of the ocean is hard to visualize for people. Um, they don't see underwater, of course. And if we saw what's happening in the oceans on a daily basis on land, there would be like much more of an uproar than there is in the oceans. And I think there's still an education battle um, to tell people really about what's happening in the oceans. We do see the change that we've experienced in the last decades um, with the so-called evil twin of global warming. On the left-hand side, you see for the last 160 years, the change of temperatures for one on the land surface showing more the greenish blue color and on the ocean in the blue color, there's a clear warming trend that is slower in the oceans than on land. It's the sluggish behavior of the ocean that I'll be referring to, but we already like have now an increase of temperatures of about depending where you draw the resonance line of roughly half a degree. In addition to that, we have an increase of atmospheric CO2. A good part of that atmospheric CO2, more than 40% is taken up by the oceans through exchange through the sea surface, um, causing of course also an increase of CO2 in the oceans, but in particular a decrease of pH values. Um, and that is something that becomes critical for calcifying animals when it drops below a certain value that the calcifying shell, for example, cannot be built up anymore. And so that's an evil twin that comes in a combination, but it's not just those two parameters that are important. Um, also oxygen is something that's always connected to climate change, it's not always entirely caused uh, by that, the, the low oxygen areas, but certainly something we need to consider. And at the same time, um, many other parameters that are important to draw lines uh, where life can be sustained um, in an ocean. There's always like a torrent level, there's a level where 
life cannot exist anymore, but it's not just temperature and pH, it's also oxygen, salinity, nutrients. There's like a certain population density that's important, but also something like sunlight exposure for corals, for example. So you cannot look at them all separately. Um, if you want to consider how much um, adaptability there is and maybe like also ways of moving into different areas where maybe temperatures aren't as warm anymore. Um, and if these animals are exposed to ocean conditions that are like beyond the usual range, then these parameters, either single parameters or combined can become critical for a single species or entire ecosystem. Then we are talking about like pressures, pressures on biodiversity and I've grouped them roughly into uh, two groups on the left hand side, the long term changes that are connected to climate change. A lot of that caused by anthropogenic input in impact like global warming, ocean acidification, also the sea level rise, which can be important and partially the oxygenation. In addition to that, there's natural climate variability that also needs to be considered. And, and then shorter term um, are effects that the natural ocean variability goes to smaller and smaller scales um, with the giant seasonal warming, ocean eddies, um, El Nino, uh, storm events that put pressure on it, um, and then lots of anthropogenic input, either indirectly through rivers in terms of um, turbidity, pollution, nutrients, whatever it may be, microplastics as well, or direct impact by human use. And that's a combination we really need to consider here in, in our discussion, because we're really talking about the combined effect of multiple pressures. And I try to highlight a little bit when we talk about the warming effect. Um, before going into that, uh, maybe, um, or maybe let's phrase this way, um, warming itself is a very slow process that takes decades. And the warming um, is something that by itself is not necessarily critical, but when it becomes in the combined with some fairly strong fluctuations caused, for example, by El Nino or local phenomena like ocean fronts or eddies moving over, that comes on top. And then suddenly thresholds are exceeded that become very critical for, for example, corals, um, where temperatures are simply too warm for them to, to thrive when it comes to coral bleaching. So it's a combination of effects. It's not just the long-term trends, it's a combination with the natural variability that we're observing anyway. One thing that you know, need to also consider is that there's a distinct difference between the surface ocean and the deeper ocean. I'm showing now a transit through the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and uh, what generally in the ocean is, is the case is that there's an exchange of heat, fresh water and gases at the ocean surface anywhere. And when that is happening, then water masses are tagged with a certain temperature and salinity. And there are certain regions in the world oceans where they subduct and leave the surface in the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic coast of Antarctica. And once it's happening, they, the water masses keep their temperature signal and keep their salinity signal for a long time. The subduction happens and spreads from there or into the entire world ocean. And um, the water masses have an age and like in these deep parts of the ocean. It means the time since they've been exposed to the sea surface then can be up to a thousand years. And that really means that the deep ocean has a very sluggish response to the changes it's observing here. Um, that's the warming effects, for example. It also means that the deep ocean takes up CO2 very slowly with that route of physical subduction. Um, and that, for one, means that we haven't seen the real uh, ocean warming signal in the deep yet that will reach there eventually. Um, but it also means that the worst part is still to come in those areas. So the sluggish response is a lot quicker on the surface and we need to distinguish between the two parts in the ocean when we talk about measures to be taken. So the, there's a couple of questions you can ask. So how much time do we have for our own uh, measures responses to, to mitigate or to respond to, to climate warming? Is there an escape for ecosystems or in the animals and what must be done overall? So maybe just roughly speaking, um, there are strategies for animals um, to, to trying to escape um, the exposure of, for example, warming. And if you kind of like narrow it down to maybe the mobility aspect, then um, of course, it's quite obvious that some species are mobile while others are not. Stationary species will have a hard time escaping when they're exposed to um, warming temperatures. And um, locally, there is no uh, escape. Um, so once the temperatures reach a critical level, then are exposed to it and can't thrive anymore. Um, that's one part. Larvae may be an escape, but um, that's something usually passive drifter that has some own issues with it. We'll talk about in a moment. 
because once they move with the same water mass, they're still stuck in that warm water. You know, they can't really escape that quickly. And then one act, it's a lot easier for active swimmers, um, be it slow or fast, to exploit that. And there's different strategies to either like uh, move horizontally, go to uh, colder climate, uh, climate zones, or to try to move deeper into the colder water that's lying underneath. That doesn't simply work, not work for all um, species. Uh, for some, it, it does. Um, that has then in turn effects on the entire ecosystem because the ecosystems do include all types of swimmers in that respect. And um, so also one thing to keep in mind when you always think, well, corals could simply move to the north or south away from the equator where it's too warm, then the other critical parameters come in where, for example, sunlight, it may not be sufficient for more sustained life. So it's not an easy escape route. Uh, what we also need to consider that the ocean currents are um, very wild in terms of having eddies in France, but there's a predominant direction. And that also means that ecosystems can't be looked at in, uh, by itself. Uh, we need to consider connectivity that, for example, larvae transport is very crucial when we talk about recruitment from one ecosystem to the next. If one upstream ecosystem is destroyed, uh, that's certainly a lot worse than when downstream ecosystems are affected by that. And uh, just mentioning very briefly, herring is a species that um, is trying to, to escape uh, by moving the system regions, but also moving deeper. They also try to spawn earlier, like in Germany, for example, in the Baltic Sea. And um, that early spawning um, is then not always easy because then the larvae don't have any food anymore to, um, that's not there yet in the seasonal cycle. And we have just experienced a 45 reduction of the fishery quota in the Baltic Sea, which is dramatic. It's a combination of fisheries, climate change, um, and other land, uh, like ocean use change that we observe here. Um, so it's certainly like an imminent problem that has tremendous economic impact as well. Um, question is what can be done? Um, when we look at the grouping that we had before, um, we need to work tremendously on mitigation of climate change, no question, but that's a long-term effort. Um, in the meantime, we must make sure that our patient um, isn't under much more threat by all the other pressures. So in my opinion, it's absolutely imminent, imminent that we take immediate action to protect the marine areas as much as possible for sustainable use of the oceans so that are as fit as possible for the climate change to come. And uh, that's something where we need to act immediately while the other nations will simply take more time because of the sluggish nature of the oceans. And the UN decade for ocean science for sustainable development is something where we need to turn enforcers from all stakeholders that are involved in the oceans overall. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Banshek. And I think that's a terrific stage setter for us because it kind of uh, gives us the, uh, the physical basis for what's occurring in the oceans. Now our next three panelists will be uh, providing their perspectives on what that physical change implies for the marine biodiversity uh, in different parts uh, of the global uh, ocean and what, what that means for us. So I'm gonna turn to each in turn and I'll ask the next three speakers just because we do wanna allow time for the questions uh, in, the, in the second half of our panel uh, to uh, try to keep your remarks tight, but let's start with uh, Dr. Iverson first to, to tell us uh, uh, her view on what this means. I'm a marine animal physiological ecologist, and I'm the scientific director of the Global Ocean Tracking Network, which is documenting the movements, habitat use, and survival of aquatic animals to advance the conservation and sustainable use of ocean resources. And in a nutshell, biodiversity in the ocean is simply critically important. It's changing and threatened. It's interconnected and inseparable from climate change crisis. And it's both impacted by climate change and also plays a critical role in resilience to climate change and its mitigation. Biodiversity underpins healthy ecosystems and the planet. It's an essential component of climate regulation, buffering the impact of ecosystem services and resilience. It provides global food security, contributes billions of dollars of socioeconomic benefits and ecosystem services annually. It's culturally and publicly significant and supports indigenous and coastal communities. But it is threatened and ch changing and threatened with an accelerating loss of populations and species on a global scale. There is continued over exploitation on top of this and loss 
fauna and biodiversity with, with a huge loss of large oceanic fish since the 1950s and with the collapse of many fisheries worldwide. And this is all weakening the ocean ecosystem and its ability to withstand disturbances, um, to adapt to climate change and to play its role as a global ecological and climate regulator. Of course, as you just heard, the oceans absorb atmospheric heat and CO2, but at huge and ever increasing costs and with an array of concomitant um, impacts. And in addition, changes in species movements are occurring with changes in water temperature. Individual species will move in or out of regions or will simply perish. And certainly in the polar regions, loss of ice cover is causing loss of habitat, loss of breeding and feeding platforms, and changes in food web assemblages. And these are simply compounded by further anthropogenic pressures. Technological advances have now made every part of the world's oceans and connected inland waters accessible for human use, in turn causing a array of um, problems, including pollution and habitat destruction, but also creating barriers and blocking safe passage for animal movements. And that is that animals, aquatic animals, must move to meet their needs, mostly following unknown routes across regional, national, and international boundaries. And during this, these movements, they face multiple and complex stressors. And this example was a 10 year project of the tracking of Pacific predators, which track species from whales to seals to tunas, sharks, turtles, and seabirds. And it simply shows how animals truly use and traverse the entire ocean. Next slide. And these movements maintain ecosystem diversity, ecosystem resilience, and stability. But there are rapid declines and disappearance of animal migrations that are occurring. And although COP, although COP15 produced a global biodiversity framework, to date, the conferences on climate and biodiversity have actually acted independently of each other. In fact, COP26 on climate lists habitat protection as one of the aims, but mostly from the standpoint of physical disturbances, storms, floods, not biodiversity protection. And COP on climate is best known, but these are completely intertwined crises that must be addressed together. Biodiversity is both impacted by climate change, yet also plays a critical role in its resilience to climate change and mitigation. And certainly other activities are addressing these international challenges. For instance, the recent UN symposium held on fisheries sustainability directly addressed 14 of the UN's 17 sustainable development goals and emphasize that biological diversity underpins the food and livelihoods of the global community and the capacity of ecosystems to produce food and other ecosystem services at levels that are resilient to climate change and other stressors. And as mentioned previous, the UN International Decade of Ocean Science was launched this year to support efforts to re reverse the cycle of decline in ocean health and to gather ocean stakeholders worldwide behind a common framework that will ensure sustainable development of the ocean. And I would end by saying that never before has it been so important to adopt multi and interdisciplinary approaches to understanding and managing aquatic populations and their ecosystems. We need to be working together globally to co-create research agendas and management strategies we need to embrace novel and disruptive technologies that allow collection of real-time data from a variety of platforms, including animals themselves, to understand and manage responses to rapid changes from the tropics to the poles. We need to design and monitor effective marine protected areas, MPAs, especially as Canada moves to implement its commitment to protect 30% of our marine areas by 2030. But these need to be globally coordinated MPAs with frameworks to prioritize, incorporate climate change effects, and measure movements. The degree to which species move in and out of MPAs or between MPAs, their effectiveness. Right now, only about 3% of the ocean is highly protected. 
But a recent study in Nature um, by Sala et al. suggests that such a coordinated global undertaking could have three major impacts, biodiversity protection, food provision, and even carbon storage. And these notions must be brought together and embraced in a coordinated fashion by integrating strategies and frameworks of the COP15 and 26 going forward. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Iverson, Thank especially for connecting that uh, those scientific impacts or the scientific perspective on those impacts with the uh, the need for uh, action now in the policy direction. And thank you also for saying ecosystem services for, for those who are listening who may not be as familiar with that term. This is really a way of trying to take account of the benefits that we derive from this massive global ecosystem, this marine ecosystem, and that when we're talking about the threat to it, we're not just talking about a threat to something that's disconnected from us, but in fact that we're Re receiving benefits from on a daily basis. Uh, I would now like to turn it to uh, Dr. Plan to uh, to pick up uh, from what you've said, Dr. Iverson, and and provide his uh, perspective on uh, on the impacts to marine biodiversity. Thank you. So um, I'm uh, responsible in France for a center of excellence in coral reef, and my talk will be mainly dedicated to coral reef. This is the, the this is the images that we would like to see, and how we would like to see coral reef. But those days, and if I can get the next slide, please. But those days, this is and this and making sure that coral reef are actually a very tiny pieces of the ocean. It's only 0.2 percent of the oceans, almost a very very sort of marginal part of the ocean. But this is 25 percent of the biodiversity of the ocean. And this is actually direct incomes for about a billion person in the world. So they're essential. And this is the type of images we would like to see when we thinking about coral reef. But the reality is actually changing those days. And the next slide will show the way we actually starting to see coral reef those days. Some people would think that white is actually beautiful. Uh, but this white is actually a sign of deaths of coral reef. It's actually the increase of seawater temperature that actually in, uh, 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 lead to the coral to sort of uh, um, uh, doesn't accept anymore the, the is, is, is marriage with an algae, the zooxanthellae, and then the coral becomes white. And after a few weeks of that situation, basically slowly die. And you can have uh, dying uh, of coral reef on, on excess very rapidly. So we have conducted a recent survey, which is one of the largest one in the world. So far just published recently with a group that is the GCRM, that is the Global Coral Reef Monitoring Network owned by or co coordinated by the ECRI, the International Coral Reef Initiative. And as part of the, um, the um, executive board of that, that roof, I'm going to refer to that the recent, recent uh, outcome of the main sort of study, more than 2 million observations accumulated, which is really the largest survey ever done on coral reef and showing the trends. So what we're seeing actually is that uh, here you have the, the evolution of the percent of, of coral that you have on a reef. You've got an average of about 35% of live coral on a coral reef. So a coral reef is not made only of coral. And so until, until 1998 and the first large sort of big El Nino event, coral reef were fairly stable. And then the, we can see that just one event that occurs in only a few months, you can lose immediately 10% of the coral reef. But coral reef are capable of recovery. And if there's no major events coming on, uh, a similar one, they recover, they come back to same level and then the, from from twenty from twenty oh nine to twenty twenty, basically we we seeing just repeated bleaching, repeated loss of coral reef, with now about fifteen percent of coral that have been lost in the world so far. Uh, and when we we sort of matching that loss of coral reef with anomality of sea surface temperature, just sea surface temperature, we can see that there's a direct match of that. So. The loss of coral reefs is really related, directly related to the increase of anomality in sea surface temperature and the increasing. And we can see that this, those anomalies are sort of being more and more, and especially since 2010, 29, there's almost continue every year. Um, when we looking at the regional scale, actually, we see more or less the same thing everywhere. And mostly there's a, a decrease from the last 10 years, the last seven years that has been 
permanent, permanent, because there's not any more time, in, enough time for the coral reef to recover. There's no time for recovering. So there's a permanent, permanent decline that we're seeing. But there's there's matter of hope in that, in that frame. And matter of hope comes from, from, come from an area that is actually the coral triangle, which is an area that by itself accumulate about 30% of the coral reef. And what we see is that we have the hard coral cover on the left and we can see that there's been there hasn't been in, uh, affected by the 1998 major sort of bleaching. There's been an increase until 2005 and then the, the 2009, sorry, and then the bleaching of 2009 also created a, a big decrease, but not as much as we can see in other places, which is fairly surprising in a, in a sense because this region is actually the region where we have most of the coral reef, but where also we have most of the population, human population around and probably the places that is the most tropical one. So there is here a question about what makes those reefs more resilient, but clearly there are reefs that are more resilient. And this is where we have to look at what's happening for the future. Next, please. So the take home message that I want to, to just from that study to say is that coral reefs are decreasing and they are decreasing very rapidly. I'll, I'll say 50% in 25 years. This is not even true. This is actually 50% in the last 12 years. So that's very fast. And the, the actual sign and the actual evolution of the, the, the anomaly on sea surface temperature really, really makes stresses because the actual situation is actually not giving at any time, any time for recovery of the coral reef. But uh, I wouldn't want to stay to, to that level. And so we, we can see that there is a matter of resilience and we have to work on that. Um, one of the what next, uh, it's actually trying to work in two directions. And that's what I want to emphasize today. And I would spend the last couple of minutes on that is that we need to anticipate what will be the core reef for tomorrow. The core reef for tomorrow will be, and there's no, uh, uh, it, there's no um, uh, um, a certainty on that, they will be different from, from the core reef we've seen now. They will be different and they will bring ecosystem services that will be different to society. So we have to start transforming transform, a transformation of our society that depends on core reef so they can start to adapt to the change on the core reef that we'll have. But we have also to work on restoration and adaptation programs. We have to give time actually to core reef to recover. We have to decrease the level of uh, uh, decline that we're seeing, and we have to try to increase actually their capability of restoration to faster, to boost their capability of rest restoration. Of course, this is not gonna change if we're not also working on, on moderating the, the climate change. This is in some ways giving time to the system to re recover so that at some stage, will be more a sort of a, a, a safe towards the, the increase of CO2 emissions. So there are some solutions that can be applied, like boosting reproduction, like cooling some areas of the reef, creating some MPAs with special, with not only, not only MPA that are just for protection of uh, versus uh, fishing, but also to provide in those MPAs actually cool, cooler water, uh, shading area, places where actually all the coral reef will be not so stressed by the, the, uh, the anomaly of, on, the, on the sea surface temperature. So this is the message I wanted to say that we have to work at least on the next, on the next 10, 15 years until we're starting to see a sign into the change on the curve of the climate change and the global warming. We have to work on those solutions. And I think that's, that's the main axis to work on. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Plan. And uh, finally, we'll go to our, uh, pan our, our last panelist, uh, Julia Baum. Dr. Baum, uh, of course, you uh, are no stranger to the plight uh, of coral reefs around the world. Uh, and as a scientist, uh, yeah, I think some of us here in Canada are used to thinking of you as kind of having one foot in the field or maybe one flipper in the field and one foot uh, uh, in the public sphere trying to raise awareness. So I'm hoping you can bring this all together uh, and, and then give us your perspective on this. Okay, great. Thank you, Ivan. I'll do my best. Uh, oceans and climate change, as we've heard, are intimately connected. In Canada, all three of our oceans, the Northeast Pacific, the Northwest Atlantic, and the Arctic are all changing rapidly because of climate change. The Arctic is warming at twice the global average, as you can see here, 
And this coupled with ever shrinking sea ice is causing massive transformation of its ecosystems. Elsewhere, increasingly acidic waters threaten Canada's shellfish industries, while changes to ocean productivity and relocating species are disrupting our marine fisheries. These changes all occur gradually, but climate change doesn't only act in this way, as has already been alluded to. It also increases variability in the system, meaning that extreme weather events are becoming more common. Wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, the record-breaking heat wave that we experienced here in Western Canada this past summer, these extreme weather events are our wake-up call for many of us, that climate change is real and it is happening now. Marine heat waves now inarguably pose one of the biggest threats to ocean biodiversity. Eight of the 10 biggest marine heat waves on record have occurred within the past decade. The one that you're seeing here took place between 2015 and 2016. These events are directly attributable to human caused climate change, and they are predicted to continue increasing both in frequency and severity. During this past summer's heat wave here on the West Coast, the ocean was also anomalously warm. And an estimated 1 billion marine animals, including the mussels that you see here, fried as temperatures for them along the shoreline soared to 50 degrees. Of all ocean ecosystems, coral reefs, as we've just heard, are most vulnerable to marine heat waves. The heat wave that I showed you that occurred between 2015 and 2016 triggered the third ever global coral bleaching event. Mass coral bleaching was recorded on the Great Barrier Reef and many other reefs around the world, but the event's epicenter was the central equatorial Pacific Ocean, and specifically the coral reef that you see before you right now. This is Christmas Island, where I've worked for over a decade. Next slide. Here, the corals endured 10 straight months of heat stress, and these stunning reefs all bleached and most of them died. If we let the planet warm by two degrees Celsius or more under climate change, most reefs, I hate to be a little bit more pessimistic than Serge, but most reefs will face the same fate by the end of this century. The losses would be catastrophic for marine biodiversity because as we've heard, not only are coral reefs the most vulnerable to climate change, they are also the most biologically diverse, housing tens of thousands of marine species. In temperate oceans, kelp forest ecosystems are most vulnerable to marine heat waves. Here on the west coast of Canada, canopy kelp, like you see here, floats on the surface. Underwater, it forms lush forests that are home to commercially and culturally important species like herring, juvenile salmon, rockfish, sea otters, and many others. While the corals were baking on Christmas Island, an even more prolonged heat wave known as the blob stretched along the entire Northeast Pacific coast, and it devastated kelp forests such that many were lost entirely and have not returned. Along the US West Coast, this heat wave caused numerous fisheries closures due to the loss of kelp forest inhabitants, harmful algal blooms, and other reverberating ecosystem changes. This and other marine heat waves also have massive socioeconomic costs. Direct losses from some individual marine heat waves have exceeded US $800 million. So the impacts and the future risks of climate change to ocean biodiversity simply cannot be overstated. So what can we do? Given the inextricable links between oceans and climate change, I would argue that climate change must be central to all of our ocean management and reciprocally, oceans must be central to fighting climate change. A recent UN report calculated that ocean-based climate change mitigation options like the ones that you see before you now could contribute more than 20% of the required greenhouse gas emissions reductions to reach the global Paris Agreement targets. Yet Canada, despite having the world's largest coastline, has yet to include the ocean in its climate solutions portfolio. Our increasingly ambitious climate targets demand that we put all solutions on the table, so this needs to change. When it comes to our fisheries, we need to directly account for probable climate change impacts in assessments of our fish stocks. We need to be applying the precautionary principle because climate change brings greater uncertainty to our oceans, and it also places them under greater stress, as we've heard repeatedly. We've also heard about the benefits of marine protected areas from other panelists. Canada is now aiming to protect 25% of our oceans by 2025 and 30% by 2030. 
but how to select where these new protected areas should be. A winning approach would be to maximize biodiversity conservation and climate change benefits. The latter could come from protecting our blue carbon ecosystems, namely our coastal eelgrass, salt marshes, and kelp forests that act as natural climate sink, carbon sinks. They could also come from protecting new areas from bottom trawling, including the Arctic, because bottom trawling contributes significantly to climate change by churning up and releasing carbon stored in seabed sediments. Beyond these ocean management measures, if we are to save coral reefs, and if we are to ensure the health of our oceans here at home, Canada needs to get serious about mitigating climate change. The window for limiting planetary warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius is closing rapidly. The United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, which starts this weekend, is being hailed as the world's best last chance to stave off the worst effects of climate, the climate crisis. Canada must deliver on its promises made in the Paris Agreement, and in doing so, stand up for the oceans and for the healthy future that we all deserve. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you very much, Dr. Baum. Uh, I'd like to now turn to some of the questions that we have from the audience. And I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. So just a heads up that we're going to extend just a little bit past the top of the hour so that we do have some time uh, to get to those questions. And what I'll do to sort of uh, um, uh, make this a bit efficient is uh, some of the questions that have come in are closely linked because um, the main thing people are asking, I think, is uh, first of all, sh sh should more be done uh, or how could more be done? And, and also what is most immediate or what actions perhaps would have the most uh, significant effect in the short term? I know uh, you have all sort of tried to provide a sense of that already in your presentations, what we need to do, but maybe we can just reiterate that and I'll go in reverse order. So I'll start with you, Dr. Baum. And just again, if you could sort of, if someone were to ask you for that short bullet point, what's the most important thing we can do right now to try to move in the right track? Well, I don't know if this is as specific as you're hoping, but I mean, the, the bottom line is that we need to be reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We need to be mitigating climate change. And that may sound obvious, but Canada is really great at talking the talk and very bad at walking the walk. So we continually make commitments that we don't live up to. Um, that's always been the case. I have a bit more hope now uh, under uh, the current Liberal government. We, you know, net zero emissions by 2020, 2050 have been enshrined in law, but now we need to do the hard work of actually making those changes happen on the ground. Got it. And I think as you say that, I should also just remind the audience of this week's World Meteorological Organization's bulletin, their annual bulletin, where they take a quantitative uh, accounting of the greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere, and they find, of course, again this year that that amount is going up. The greenhouse gases are still going up. That's not a surprise, of course. If you look out the window and you see fossil fuels being used, which uh, which we see all around us, that means the levels are going up in the atmosphere. But I think what's more alarming is that the rate of increase is also continuing to go up. So not only are we adding more. Uh, uh, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we're, we're actually adding it still at an increasing rather than a decreasing rate. So, uh, so a pretty sobering for everyone to be aware of. Um, uh, Dr. Plan, how about from your perspective, how, uh, you know, if you wanted to sort of sharpen action or if you had one message for, uh, for delegates next week or for people involved in ocean policy, what would you say? Of course, I share what um, Dr. Bond said. That's, that's we have to reduce emission, uh, CO2 emission. That's 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 the baseline. But this is not going to be enough because if we're doing that by 2050, by that time, for example, for coral reef and probably from some forests, we'll have lost those ecosystems. We'll have lost them dramatically, not to entirely lost, but we'll have transformed them, and we have made probably very very uh, uh, with low bi biodiversity. So we need also jointly to that, in parallel to that action, immediately to have some engineering base, to have some species base, ecosystem based solution that at least mitigate the impact, present impact of the, of the, of the global warming. And so to give time to those ecosystems, basically to, to cross that period where we still are in a phase of increasing or mitigating or decreasing and hopefully decreasing CO2. So to me, there is a two stage, two uh, uh, parallel line. One is, of course, working on the CO2 emission and immediately, but we know that's going to 
really started to show some effect in 10, 15, probably 20 years from now. And so the, during those 20 years, we need to have also a more technical engineering and, 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 and probably humanity concerned solutions such as reducing uh, like um, river plumes and things like that, where we can, we can find several options and several social solutions on that. Got it. Uh, thank you very much. And Dr. Iverson, same question for you. How, uh, you know, given all of these impacts, what would you prioritize for uh, the, the most uh, significant immediate action? Um, absolutely agree with um, both um, Julia and Serge. That I, but this, I guess the thing is, is that obviously, ultimately, emissions have to be reduced. And I expect that's what COP26 is going to be talking about. But at the same time, if we link that with biodiversity, there is really strong evidence that that can help with some of those carbon emissions and the food provision and the services that we need. So we have to work on both at the same time. And I think the idea of um, more areas of the ocean that are protected in whatever fashion is going to be critical and critical now. Got it. And actually, before I go to Dr. Bashak, I want to follow up with you, Dr. Iverson, about one of the other questions from the audience, which is how to integrate this better. I think it's probably a bit startling for people that, uh, you know, we have these two cops and that they sort of, you know, they both originated at the same time, uh, you know, sort of from the Earth Summit that, you know, that kind of led us to a climate panel and a biodiversity panel. And they've largely kind of gone separately. Uh, how it sounds like we need to integrate this better because it's all a related problem. Um, what, what uh, I, you know, what would you say uh, to, to, to how to make that possible or how, how do we uh, get more synergy? Well, biodiversity and particularly ocean biodiversity should be in the agenda of COP26, front and center. The ocean controls so much of what is going on in the, the weather systems and the um, um, controlling you know, heat, um, CO2. They, they just can't be separated. And I don't, you know, looking at the COP26 agenda, I don't see that on it. And I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, Dr. Banshek, I also have a question for you. I, I'm interested in what you think would be an appropriate immediate action, but I also want to ask you because I was really struck with how you described the lag, you know, these the sort of two, uh, uh, like the evil twin of climate change in the atmosphere, this warming in the ocean, and the fact that there's a lag and that it's somewhat sluggish and that there's yet a, a, another lag, this kind of a disconnect with what's, what's happening in the deep ocean, which of course makes me wonder if we do get to the point, and this is a big if, where the atmosphere is kind of moving in the right direction, what does that, what do those lags imply for the ocean? Because I, I get a feeling that uh, uh, maybe uh, getting the ocean back on track will take longer than, uh, than, than getting the atmosphere moving in the right direction. Uh, yeah, maybe like getting to the last question first. I mean, the sluggish response means um, in the positive way that the ocean hasn't really seen the full effect of uh, atmospheric warming yet because the heat exchange hasn't been really put the ocean equilibrium. It just takes a very long time. Um, on the other hand, whatever signals we are seeing or are producing right now will prolong the ocean for a lot longer. And it really comes down to the question how quickly we can turn things around so that this uh, long-term effect in the ocean is a little bit uh, mitigated. Um, yeah, so that's sort of like a critical thing that we need to, to consider here. Um, because the sensitivity of many ocean animals, in particular in tropics, is a lot narrower than in the atmosphere where um, atmospheric uh, and that's why the temperature um, tolerance of animals also I mean, that means you can't really translate of the warming and the atmosphere in the, on the land in the same way to the ocean and so that's I think something to consider and now going back to the measures to be taken um, yes we need to take immediate action on reduction of um, greenhouse gases uh, but the effect on the oceans will be also like a sluggish one and if you look at the dramatic decrease of the state of the oceans in the last years, not even decades, years, um, we may be too late with the response the ocean will have because of its sluggish nature in many respects. And that's why I do think that an immediate measure on protecting the oceans, marine protected areas, um, in an integrated way um, is crucial to have as 
healthy ecosystem as possible to be able to sustain uh, the longer term climate change. And that I think what the focus needs to be right now, in addition to the um, reduction of greenhouse gases. And if you ask more what can be done, be done, I think the education effort to really show people a lot better like how bad in some parts the state of the ocean is. Um, I also do think that a reduction and a uh, like not, not putting out as much CO2 by itself is not in, enough. We need to really work on technical solutions to support that and investment in sustainable um, ocean solutions, put it that way, is a crucial measure that needs to be taken at the same time. Got it. Uh, I, uh, I also would like to ask all of you just maybe one more question across the board. We're just a little bit over time now, but uh, if I can... Uh, Get one more question, one more answer from each of you, uh, from your own perspectives. You know, and this also relates to one of the questions we have from the audience. This idea of integration, it does seem like we have a lot of problems to solve at the same time. It's, of course, we are talking both about climate change and biodiversity, but there are other issues as well. There are equity issues in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what's uh, happening to different people around the world, different economies around the world. Uh, and as we shift the globe or try to shift the globe to a different way of doing business, that's going to have an impact uh, uh, on people. And, and uh, perhaps there will be inequities that come from that. There are also issues like uh, uh, how we deal with uh, agriculture and food supply, food security, uh, and human migration and, you know, many other, many other issues that are going on at the same time. And it somehow feels like solving uh, one problem is going to require solving all of the problems. So, uh, you know, given that we're trying to integrate a broader perspective here, um, what, what do you recommend or, or what you sort of, I guess what I want to ask is what is the perspective that you recommend for how we tackle this and uh, and think about it uh, holistically. Um, uh, great, thanks very much. Why don't I start, we'll, we'll, we'll go in order again. Uh, Dr. Beshek, I'll, I'll come to you first just with that broader picture. Uh, how do we kind of take in to kind of the broader, uh, e you know, kind of public economic uh, uh, equity issues as well with the oceans. Yeah. It's tremendously important. Maybe just like as a, as a background information, um, the uh, population, the po population that lives at the coast, and we're talking about 100 kilometers away from the coast, is more than 40 percent right now. That percentage is increasing as well as the overall population is. So we are very intertwined with the oceans. Usually, we think about like oceans being somewhere deep, like far away in the deep oceans, but really starts right at the beaches and actually starts beyond that at the coast. And we have that part where lots of bottom economies are based, all the major cities are based in, in the coastal areas. And that's also like where pollutions come in. So we're really intertwined and we need to extend our discussions about the oceans to the coast at the same time. Otherwise, we're not going where we need to be. Um, and yes, I think it's a very critical part that you mentioned that the discussion that we have about the, the degradation of our environmental state is as much one about environmental justice and rights. So who's suffering most under the degrading ecosystems um, and who also has best access to the solutions we're providing. Uh, we make, need to make sure, of course, that that's like reaching across um, ethnicities, um, uh, wealthy, poor people at the same way, and of course, uh, covering not just the rich people, but also like um, all the nations that live in and at the ocean. Got it. Dr. Iverson, from your perspective, uh, how do we bring that together? And I'll, let me just add to that, is there some kind of more central form of leadership or conversation that needs to happen that takes into account all of the ocean impacts? Oh, you're on mute. Pretty major questions. Um, I, I guess the point being that uh, first is recognizing that um, if we don't have a planet, <laughs> we don't have any of the other problems that we're talking about. And I think um, that basically the climate and ocean has taken a back seat to all the immediate problems. And, and we, we simply can't let that happen anymore because there will be no you know, nothing to support humanity. Um, I think global coordination is critical 
Um, I've seen it through our partnerships that we built through the Ocean Tracking Network in helping developing countries partake in some of the work and appreciate some of the rewards from it. And, you know, education and outreach is really important to, so that the public um, has a stake in this and understands how important it is. And I guess I think, you know, simply um, addressing these things as a top priority is, is all we can do. We have lots of tools to do so, but we need political buy-in. Got it. Uh, Dr. Plan, from your point of view, how do we uh, how do we make that bigger connection to other things? I, I think with climate, it's perhaps easier for people now that they're seeing the impacts of forest fires or severe floods, you know, in in uh, inhabited areas in the in the developed world. A lot of the ocean impacts are happening in in parts of the world where where a lot of uh, a lot of the decision makers don't live. So, how do you uh, connect the dots on that? That, that's to me one of the hard questions is that when you're starting to link economy to 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 biodiversity when you're starting to lo to link economy to ecosystem services that's where where it comes because if as soon as you're talking about economy you're talking about you're talking about politics immediately so all those get links to me well one of the way to think about it is actually responsibility so so because because when there's a major event, there's a risk. Everyone, everybody wants to, and when there's a major drama, everyone wants to find. Everyone wants, wants to find a responsible. And so, if we're starting to think about a state as responsible, if we're starting to start at and such as en those entities as responsible, and if we're starting to make them pay in some ways as responsible, like if you have an insurance system, uh, that's that's an, that's some ideas that should be bringing that. Uh, that. The other things that I would say is that so. We have to bring in some ways the economy into the into the the, the loss of the, the we having into the, all the ecosystem services of our planets that we having and those ecosystem services are based on the healthy biodiversity healthy ecosystem of course so that that's to me one option is that is to embed it more actually the responsibility and the economic responsibility of the different people or the different countries actually not people that are bringing that the other things that i'm i'm always a more optimistic person i i find that actually the younger generation are actually much more concerned by by looking at how they use the the the, the, the basically the the fossil uh resources how they prefer to be careful about using the car or using uh, or looking at the the, the food they 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 eating and everything, and I have hope actually that there will lead to some change in into the politics. So that's that's the two aspects that I would say. I think maybe linking more some insurance ideas uh, on the economic of and then basically insuring biodiversity. Why not finding a way of insuring the the healthy ecosystem? And then if you damage it, well, who pays for that damage? And then, and then in the second, in the second aspect is, is having open the into the the younger generation. I'm I'm not sort of included in that young generation, but I'm having great hope on them. Maybe because I've got child and so about open them. Thank you. <laughs> I, I hear you, but we're we're sure putting a lot of pressure on that younger generation. Uh, Dr. Baum, I want to give you the last word on that same theme, but maybe we could just turn it back to Canada for a minute especially because some of our uh, 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 audience has been asking about, you know, what new leadership would look like. Do we need better leadership on this? Canada has the longest coastline. Is, is you know, should Canada be, Canada be taking more of a leadership role to try to pull all this together? And what would that look like? Yeah, great questions. Um... Wow. Uh, well, coming back to what Sarah said, uh, I really agree that we need deeper integration between climate and biodiversity. So, for example, in Canada, um, the federal government is trying to build what's being touted as a blue economy, but with very little recognition of the state of the ocean or the impacts of climate change. And so we really need to be thinking about how all of these things are interconnected. We simply can't develop a blue economy on a sick or dying ocean. So those things need to be really thought about more. Um, Sarah was talking about the need for global coordinated efforts, and I really agree with that. Coordination needs to be taking place at, at all levels. So in Canada, it needs to be taking place at, at all jurisdictional levels, but also across all disciplines. So climate change impacts every facet of, of life on Earth, but also, as you said, 
um, our economies and social issues, there's human health issues. And so it's my belief that we simply can't address and solve these issues if we aren't all working together. So one of the things that I think we need is a national institute for climate solutions that would bring together uh, leading scholars from all areas, not just oceans people, but engineers and economists, um, public policy people, artists, and link us with politicians, policymakers, industry, NGOs, and of course the public to start really thinking about these issues in an integrated manner, because that's what it demands in order to have solutions that actually benefit everyone. We don't want solutions that you know, solve one problem and make another worse. And I think by working together, we can really think about those integrated solutions that are win-win. You know, that's a really interesting idea. And I think it might serve another purpose as well, which is when people are talking about uh, trying to uh, improve the situation in different directions with respect to either climate change or biodiversity, and where we see perhaps policies across the country that might be moving in opposite directions or might, you know, yeah. we're trying to do something good here, but maybe not so good is happening over here. There, there's a kind of public cynicism that can come from that where it's like, well, what are we really doing? Uh, and so perhaps putting all the chips on the table and having that global or having that integrated conversation even at a national level would, would help. Anyway, another great idea. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've, we've gone over enough that we really should bring it to a close. So we'll leave it at that for now, but obviously there's much more of the conversation that uh, could still carry on and will carry on. Uh, and, and I encourage everyone to kind of follow the media coverage and, and keep a close eye on what uh, uh, in, uh, international delegates and scientists are saying in the coming weeks. So uh, with that, I wanna thank our panelists so much for your time and your contributions today. That includes uh, Professor Burkhard Bashek, uh, Dr. Sarah Iverson, Dr. Serge Plan, Dr. Julia Baum. A reminder that today's event is being recorded and it will be posted online in both English and French. And on behalf of the Royal Society of Canada and the embassies of France and Germany and Canada uh, and myself and the Globe and Mail, I wanna thank you, the audience, for your interest and your participation today. Uh, please join the conversation, continue the conversation on Twitter by following at RSC, the academies. And if you have any other additional questions about today's event or future events, please send them by email to events at rsc-src.ca. Goodbye and have a wonderful day.